while I'm doing this, again, Coach, thank you for doing this. Not only, um, you know, all the time you spend helping save lives, number one, in terms of the, the, the charity that you run and spend so much time with, but uh, giving all of us coaches, um, you know, kind of a, a break from reality, getting back and sharing some basketball ideas. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the other coaches speak as well. Hopefully some of the things I bring to the table can be helpful, um, you know, to some of, some of our listeners. It's also productive for me to get away for an hour from uh, my household, which contains four kids under six. So I appreciate that as well. Um, I'm going to talk about a common, a common uh, concept right now that I think is, is being taught and used a lot. Um, so I'm going to try not to be too um, vanilla with it and just kind of spew out things that I think anybody can go to any YouTube video and see. I hope to maybe give you guys insight more into how we day to day teach not running a ball screen and, and the plays that we run, um, but more so uh, how we teach the decision making aspect of it. Um, and I should probably start by giving a brief history of uh, where kind of where some of these ideas came from. And, and, you know, I think, I think everything really starts with everything you do as a team. We all know is what type of players we have. So, you know, for instance, at Villanova, when we would run pick and roll, um, you know, we would, we would use four different players to run it on the court at all times. And, and that's not something we've done so much at Quinnipiac because our personnel doesn't allow for that. But I thought one thing Coach Wright did an amazing job was, you know, allowing his um, players to play to their strengths. And so, for instance, we would have a guy like Josh Hart running pick and roll but not really looking to make all the reads. It wasn't so important that he did that. He was going to um, almost use a ball screen to score, turn into isolation, or make a very simple pass just to get out of the play. Um, another example of that would be Chris Jenkins would use a ball screen to get a three off. And um, you know he would make a roll pass occasionally, but really try and get a three, move the ball. And then guys like Jalen Brunson, Ryan Archidiakono, they were kind of more your traditional, like, hey, we're reading the big, we're making the right play. For us, the last couple of years, we, we've had the, um, the strength of having good spot up shooters and then a point guard that could really shoot the ball off the dribble so teams couldn't go under his ball screens. And that was really valuable for us and a reason that we used uh, pick and roll uh, in a heavy volume within our offense. So I think for us and all of us, really understanding what our personnel is dictates a should we use pick and roll should we use ball screen and if so what type should we use and how should we teach it so you know coming from a perspective understanding our personnel as I show you some of our practice clips and our game clips understanding um, you know what we were trying to get out of it and, and the strengths that we were trying to play to uh, the, the, the most important thing hopefully that I can share today again is the decision making that we teach how we build it up in practice and how it kind of comes to fruition in the game. And, and we really try and uh, engage all of our players in that. So um, I'll start with just the idea of why we use pick and roll. And, and I think all of us as coaches that use it understand, especially off missed baskets, or if you want to play a little faster, or if you don't want to control every aspect of the game, uh, it's a concept that's great in terms of establishing an early connection amongst all five of your players. What I mean by that is once, once the screener and the ball handler come together, I think it's important for all five guys, whether you play two bigs, one big, a uh, spread system, everybody knows how to react based on what those two guys do together. Um, if, if the guard rejects it, where do all four other players go? If he uses it, uh, if, he gets, if he gets blitzed, if he gets hedged, everybody knows how to react uh, in harmony. And I think that's one of the hardest things to teach, and it takes time to rep and get on the same page. Obviously, it forces the defense to make early and multiple decisions. So if you're going to run multiple pick and rolls within a possession, you're making the defense communicate multiple times. And then going into a game, obviously, you know, have an idea of how teams play uh, their ball screen defense. So being able to rep that out um, and understand how everybody is prepared to react within that game. Uh, the terminology that we use for that, for that advantage that you're trying to create within the ball screen is creating a trigger, which is something I just read and I, I like that Eric Spolstra had used. I don't know if he came up with it or not, but 
I guess it was just a term that I thought sounded cool that our players would embrace, but also just getting our players to understand the most important thing we do offensively is create that advantage, that trigger where two players are playing the ball and then we have a four on three advantage somewhere else. And ball screens, again, ball screens are, the, are one of the best ways to do that. We try and educate our players on how that happens. Specifically, if you get a, you get a turnover, you get a defensive rebound, that's a great opportunity to get a trigger without even having to run a play by playing transition offense. So as we move forward, you know, one thing I think uh, I've learned in the last couple of years in running a lot of ball screens is uh, educating not only the, the, the handler, but also the screener and all the players off the ball on how to react to specific coverages. And, and one thing we've run into is if a team plays uh, maybe a coverage we don't play defensively, um, like, like trapping the pick and roll. You know, we're more um, conservative in our approach to guarding the pick and roll traditionally. But if teams are going to trap it, to blitz it, uh, we don't want to go into a game and say, hey, guys, uh, this team's going to blitz us on these pick and rolls. So now, day before the game, we got to get some reps of that. So what we've, what we've kind of formulated is the idea of defensively, we all do shell drills. And kind of offensively, we like to mirror it and do the same thing. So we'll do some offensive ball screen shell. And that's most of what I'll show you today uh, from our practice. And, and guys, I think Coach Papali explained this, but um, as questions come up, I think as you, as you put those in the, the chat box, he'll collect those and we'll go through as much as we can at the end. So just listing a few of the different um, angles of ball screens that we'll use. I'm sure a lot of you use these and, and they're nothing, um, you know, nothing new to a lot of you, but just in terms of our terminology and how we teach it, um, ace versus deuce, you know, an ace is one guy on a side with an empty corner. Uh, we, we mostly run our ball screens with a five man and you can see three, three shooters spread opposite. So that's an ace. Deuce would be corner filled with a roller, and we call this our lift man. And then we can do the, both of those, those ball screens, obviously, with what we call uh, a step angle, you know, with the, the ball side corner filled uh, and the ball side corner also empty. Maybe some, uh, again, some more traditional things. When we push somebody through in transition, we call that push ace. Uh, a drag deuce, again, those are transition ball screens for us. We like to run double ball screens, uh, pistol, or what we would call L, where uh, our four-man ran to the ball side corner and can, can step up and set a ball screen and use a flare. So that's kind of more pistol action. But again, that's not what this presentation is about, but just giving you a feel for how we would use our, um, how would you, we would use our personnel to get into kind of common, familiar ball screens. And that when we run our offensive shell, these are the things that we're going to try and get ourselves into. Uh, and then dictating how the defense is going to play so we have to react. Here are some of the, here are some of the teaching points that we like to cover um, for, our, for our creator and our screener. And I think the biggest thing, and we rep this obviously one on O, two on O, and then we build up into our three on three, four on four, five on five, is I think we spend so much time with guards on how to read the big, how to read the situation. But you know, personally, I probably haven't put enough time into educating our screeners um, on what to do based on what their man is doing. So you know, we could create a little bit of a list for these guys and, and they come in the office and they watch their own individual film and pick and roll. And I think the biggest, the biggest recognition points for, for the big guys is they got to sprint to set screens, trying to create separation. Um, but then just understanding by scout and then by feel within a game, the first thing is, is their man playing above the ball screen or are they below it? And, and that really dictates whether or not uh, that guy's going to hit and hold or if that guy's going to slip out of it. And, and then we would call that touch and go. Um, and that's really the biggest decision they have to make is, am I, am I staying in this? Am I trying to help my guard create, you know, that trigger by hitting and holding? Or am I just kind of touching that guy guarding the handler and slipping out of it because my man's getting above? And that's something that, we work on a lot in our one on 0 2 on 0 breakdowns just to get a feel, and then it translates into our competitive drills. The next thing they'll understand is 
Am I, am I looking to roll hard all the way to the basket or am I short rolling? And again, that's dictated by the coverage of the defense. So our, our, our bigs, I think, take pride in the fact that they need to know the, the scout offensively, just like they do defensively in terms of defensive coverages that the, the opponent will use. Um, and then our ability within a game to say, hey, they're starting to get more aggressive on us. Uh, hey, they're blitzing us now. They're hedging us hard. We've got to adjust. We've got a touch and go. We've got a short roll and be available. Obviously, same thing for our creator. The thing that we emphasize most is probably the way we set it up. And, and in setting it up, we're not just taking a couple dribbles to um, move the ball into a certain area. We're really trying to reject the ball screen when we can. And then when the defense does a great job of taking away that reject, it serves as our way of setting up that ball screen. Um, if the defense allows us into the paint attacking downhill based on their coverage, that's what we want. And then we really, we really emphasize the idea of against aggressive coverages, we want to use an escape dribble. And I think for smaller guards, uh, for instance, we had a point guard these last couple of years that needed to create that space that didn't have great size but also didn't have the quickness to maybe split a ball screen very often. So him, him creating that space and escaping to create passing angles and to create vision was really important uh, for him. You know, th this, is a, this is a list I'm happy to share with anybody. Again, it's not rocket science. And I, and I think really it comes down to how you get a lot of reps of this in practice. We try and we're gonna do some, and I'll show you some one-on-o work, two-on-o work with the guards and forwards just to get them comfortable and confident. But where we really like to spend the majority of our time is, is not just repping the techniques, but repping uh, live action decision-making. So in terms of knowing our job, you know, we kind of create three separate uh, entities here. We've already talked about the creator and the screener. Uh, and then obviously everybody who's spacing off the ball. And the general idea for our guys off the ball uh, is, again, understanding the scouting report, understanding the opponent and the situation. And the general idea we like to, to promote is if the team that we're playing against plays passive ball screen defense, they drop their big uh, below the point, most of the time they're trying to stay home on the perimeter with our spacers. And if that's the case, we want to really emphasize hard cutting off the ball. Um, cutting and second cutting, uh, which, which obviously we'll, we'll go through and I'll show you some clips of what I mean by that. Uh, when we know an opponent is going to be aggressive and blitz and hedge hard, uh, get, our, get us up the floor and take away the ball handler, that's where we don't really mess around with too much exchanging and, and cutting. We really want to be available because the quicker we can get that ball out of our ball handler's hands and go, go play four on three, we always talk to our team about the defense by blitzing or trapping has handed us the trigger without us really having to work for it. Um, and so the escape dribble, the create space, move the ball, and then go play four on three, ball reversal, play against closeouts again, which, which we will cover. Okay, but you know, our creator's job is to look to reject and set it up. We talked about coming, coming off shoulder to shoulder, reading the big, and then going through his progression. Uh, again, our screener, creating separation, sprinting. The screener has to learn to read his own man. And then again, screening options are hit and hold, touch and go. And we talk a lot about angles, especially against teams that like to force direction uh, and, and, and ice, push sideline and baseline. Again, rim roll, short roll, off the ball. We just call, like if we're running a, um, a deuce ball screen, lifting out of the corner, we're running a step ball screen, filling filling from the slot to the top of the key, giving our guy handling the ball as many options as possible. Um, these are some embedded links. So I want to kind of just show you guys a couple of, of examples of, of, what, of what we mean by these. So obviously, um, you know, when we talk about a hit and hold, let's see, hopefully this will work here, good. Um, you know, we're going really into the idea of, Seth Pinckney here is setting a screen, understanding that his man is below the level. So that's his first read. This is a great example of shoulder to shoulder. The defense is allowing us downhill, so we're going to take it. 
I mean, we have some good shooters who can shoot the three off ball screen. So the option also here is if you run your man into the screen and he's dropping back, this three is a good shot for some of our players, maybe not such a good shot for others. Now we've engaged the big and Seth's job. I think a lot of times our forwards wonder, Hey, when should I, when the, when the big is dropped, when should I be looking to receive a pocket pass? And when should I be looking to get a lob over the top? And that's not our bigs decision. That's not something I want them thinking about. I want them thinking about rolling hard. And if this big were to drop all the way back to the rim, your pass would come via pocket pass and you just expect it. But if he's gonna stay up a little bit here, again, you can see some of the attention to detail uh, guarding our shooters, it's gonna open up the paint. So we're always trying to get these bigs to hit and hold and then as quickly as possible, get behind the defense. And that opens up verticality and opens up the rim for love. But repping it enough to allow us not to have to think quite so much and really that big saying, okay, I got to hit and hold. I'm going to roll hard. And then the defense is going to decide whether I get this pass via pocket pass or via lob. Here would be an example of kind of the, uh, the opposite. of a touch and go. And this is, a, this is an example uh, against Monmouth who switched a lot. So at times we would treat switching almost like blitzing uh, when teams didn't do a great job of getting under the roller. And then also they used uh, random blitzes within the half court. And we would call a situation like this. When this would happen, we would say, hey, that's basically like they're handing us a trigger. Let's go play four, four on three. And so our screener who was planning on setting a ball screen, this may not be the best example, but he essentially, instead of even coming up to the level, he just slips it. He's available in the middle of the floor. And now he knows this is a short roll to the nail. And then now this is something we work on a ton with our bigs and they take great pride in it, is reading the help. Obviously, if this guy stays home on a good shooter, it's a dunk. And if this guy comes in and helps, which he does, it's an immediate extra pass. And then finally, our screener understanding the idea of flipping the angle. This is against St. Peter's who did a great job of pushing ball screens to the sideline. You can see how they uh, don't even wanna let our ball handler into the middle of the floor. So an important part of this is that Matt Belanc here is still above the corner. We would want him lower Rich Kelly understands they're not going to let me middle the score, but I can use my dribble essentially to try and reject it. They're trying to send me baseline. So I'm going to go try and go middle. Apologies. I'm going to try and get middle to set it up and then I'll bring it back. And again, Seth Pinckney is just reading, okay, my guy is below the screen. I'm going to touch and I'm going to go and get behind him. And then so now all Rich has to read is the, the weak side help, good shooter weak side, not full on help. The lob at the rim gets opened up. Here's another example. You can see a lot of just kind of false motion. Kanish just does a good job of pressuring the ball. We're flipping that angle against ice, understanding that we're sending our ball handler where we can get good contact here. And then again, even though we're being iced and downed or whatever your terminology is, all Seth has to realize after he changed the angle is his band's below the screen. So we want him to roll hard. This could be a pocket pass right now, but what Rich is realizing, if he just waits one dribble, Seth's going to get behind that guy. And then obviously having a seven-footer that you can kind of throw it up to confidently always helps. And then those shooters that, that spread the court. I'll give one example, and again, we're going to our practice clips, but I want to see and just show an example of, again, because I think, I think we're all accustomed to teaching our guards, but what I've had to get a lot better at and spend more time on is educating our forwards. Um, 
And, and this is something we take, again, take great pride in spending a lot of time on. And you can't spend a lot of time on everything, as we know as coaches. So this is where we choose to spend a lot of our time. So we do it. So we need to understand and be good at it. Um, again, so right here, we, we get what's called a push ace. We're pushing a player through. We're creating an empty side. We should have a better uh, – we should probably do a little better job of using this. But all Seth reads is – his man's above him, so he no longer needs to hit and hold. He's touching and going and finding the ball. Rich does a good job of uh, delivering this pass. And this is something that we work all the time in our guards forwards breakdown drills, is we'll have a walk-on or a coach at the rim, a walk-on or a coach in the corner. And all we're doing is with this guy either coming aggressively to try and take a charge and he needs to deliver that pass, or faking and denying, and he needs to turn this into a dunk. And it's really just him in a dummy drill reading this coach or this walk-on time after time after time. And Seth is not a guy that got a lot of reps of that in high school, um, didn't come in with a great understanding of it, but really improved throughout the year as a playmaker. And this is where we try and promote our forwards in a guard-centric offense as playmakers. And so for him to read this and not to allow this to become a charge, to know that the pass here is going to go opposite is something we take great pride in. Um, and after games and post-game edits, we really want to uh, do a good job of praising those guys for that work. More of a flat angled ball screen, which is another thing we like to use. And then now, again, Seth rolls hard thinking about getting behind the defense and the ball handler just decides the pocket pass is the best pass. And then again, with the attention, a little bit of late help, a little bit of late help, Seth can read, this can be a rim roll dunk. So those are two examples of how we would work things in practice that are translating into the game and, and our bigs being able to make those reads. So I'll just move forward here um, and just show you a little couple, we'll move through these, but simple breakdowns in practice. We don't want to spend a ton of time on these because I don't think it's really training the cognitive, the, the decision-making, but it is giving us muscle memory um, and some reaction. So the first thing we'll look at um, is just simple one-on-o -on rejecting a ball screen. And we're just going to go through our progression, pass and follow. Again, you know, this is probably before we've stretched at the beginning of practice. Now we're playing against drop, so we're using it. We're seeing the big in front of us, and we want to go play one-on-one -on -one with the big. And then same thing at the other end for the forwards. Right now, they're just working the hit and hold and hard roll. We haven't instituted any help defense yet. We haven't put any decision-making into it. We're just saying to them, hey, the defense, is, the defense is low on different angled screens. We're working some pocket passes. We'll work some lobs. And we haven't really instituted any decision making on these, uh, and we'll, but we'll add that as we go. Okay, and then as we as we move, uh, especially early in the season, we'll want to use a lot of three on three uh, as we get into our shell. And all we're trying to do is create as many decision-making opportunities for our players as we can. And, and really carrying over some of the simple stuff that we're doing in our one-on-o and our two-on-o. So this, these first clips, you'll see us, we're telling our defense. During the season, this defensive green team, a lot of times will be made up of our scout team, some red shirts and some walk-ons. And we'll be telling them, hey, you know, you're going to play a coverage right now that's different than we do. Your emphasis is on taking away threes or your emphasis is on do not let this roller get into a layup. So you'll see some ugly defensive possessions, but a coach has just whispered in their ear, hey, no three on this possession. Let's see if they can hit the roller. Uh, no roll. Make them skip it. So you can see, uh, like, in this, if I was coaching this, I would say, hey, we need to do a better job of sprinting into that screen. Good job setting it up. Not a good job shoulder to shoulder. Downhill attacking off the ball screen. Good job sprinting. Good job hitting and holding. 
and then a good job of our guard going and playing one-on-one -on -one against a big, and that's where we're saying, hey, those are the finishes we've got to get better at. Good setup, good hit and hold versus low coverage. Now he sees the big in front of him, and our roller has to go try and get behind that big. He does that. For me, I would prefer that to be a lob to a seven-footer. On this possession, the coach probably told our defender, do not give up lift three. Pretty good job of getting that ball through to our roller. Again, we're going against drop coverage. Good shoulder to shoulder. We're engaging downhill. Good pocket pass. Good reading of the help. This is a fake and deny on the weak side. Pretty good job by our defensive big to get back in front. And then a, just a talented shot. I know this is going to happen a couple times here. So on this one, this is a good example. Good shoulder to shoulder, good hit and hold. We recognize the defense is playing this thing low. So the pocket pass is open. If this, if this defender stayed higher, we could hit over the top to a lob. Pocket pass. And then again, our big now has to read his man, but also the help. These would be, these would be done in our one on o, two on o breakdowns against the coach. Really good read. And then now comes to our off-ball decision-making, reading the closeout. Pretty good job. Pretty good job. Again, using our pivot, we work a lot on using live dribble, but also our pivot to set up our ball screen. Good job shoulder to shoulder. Good job opposite. Good job versus the closeout, re-space. We, we had some guys that could make some threes. Now we'll do the same thing with defensively. Three on three. Again, we're building confidence here. This is much easier to do three on three offensively, but we're getting a ton of reps in and we're getting our guards and our forwards really to read the coverage. So our progression will be, we'll normally go three on three low, three on three high, and then we'll add something different, three on three switch, three on three ice. Uh, and then we'll do the same thing five on five. And how we like to really end it is five on five, defense huddles up and they're trying to surprise us with different coverages and we have to react. So a pretty good sprint to screen, really good escape dribble right there. And now we're playing in space. You know, we really want to get as many reps as we can of this guy making the right play off this catch. This guy delivering a pass against two players and this guy being spaced and ready to make plays if it comes his way. So again, Seth reading, the rim is open. We had told our off ball player no three there. Again, really good left-handed escape here by Rich, creating space. Good finish. Good job creating space. This pass comes over the top. And I think in our drills, sometimes we can get really specific with passes, but it's important for our guards to be able to play against live play against size and have to deliver different types of passes and get it there. We had a big and Kevin Marfo that really liked to pass. And, uh, you know, you could argue maybe he should have tried to dunk that or get fouled, but we want to reward those big guys for being unselfish. And then this is more of a four-man short rolling right here, but doing a good job, again, of reading this defender and getting reps of those reads three on three. Again, another pretty good escape. Brendan McGuire is a wing for us. It's a really good passer. Does a good job hitting the short roll, immediate opposite. And then again, you get a lot, of, a lot of work in practice against playing against closeouts. And again, I think it's important you have defensive points of emphasis for your scout team. Uh, in this one, we've definitely said run these guys off the line and make them make plays off the dribble. So we end up with a pull-up jumper, which is fine. Again, that escape, not worrying about hitting and holding but just touch and go and find the ball. And then a guy playing to his strengths off the ball in Aaron foul zone that could really shoot the ball. Escape, skip now, playing against the closeout, drive and kick. So you're getting a lot of different, uh, a lot of work from all three facets right here in the ball handler, the roller, 
And then now our guy off the ball playing against closeouts. Now, and then you get kind of unintentional work as well. We talk about drive and space. This is a ball screen drill. But right now, our big needs to read, this guy's driving right at me. So he needs to be moving opposite the ball and creating that space. So these are the things we would watch with our bigs in breakdowns. But again, we say drive, fill behind. Good job by Rich Kelly filling behind, being available for a pass. So you can see, all right, those are just two examples, low and high, kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. All right, we'll do the same thing. Like I said, we'll normally add in something, um, a third coverage, whether it's switch, ice, something to a defense maybe we're playing against soon, we'll do. But I also want our players to know, like, hey, we're working against ice. We're working against blitzes. We're working against switches. Um, even random days where it doesn't matter what our opponent does. So it's not, hey, we're doing this scout. This is the first time we've worked on ice in six weeks. Now we'll move it to five on five. When we do this, we're gonna start running some of our stuff in the half court or intentionally get to certain angles of the ball screen and play against that coverage. So now we're moving into five on five versus low. So we'll run a couple of our sets here, a little bit of false motion into the ball screen. And you can see the roller get behind, defense staying home. And we needed reps of this in practice of being able to throw Seth lobs just because it was something he was good at. And we wanted to make sure we were getting reps of it. So in low coverage, our guys were working on that pass behind the defense. Another play we would run often, just out of a horn set. Probably not a great example of hit and hold or shoulder to shoulder versus a dropped coverage, but a good job of rolling hard, trying to get behind the defense and our guard deciding not to throw it late, but to throw it early. Again, our forward doesn't need to worry about what he should be rolling for. Roll hard against a low coverage, and when the guard decides to deliver it, be ready. Good roll. And then that's something we would talk about on film is, hey, let's make sure we extend to finish with that left hand. All right, here's, here's a five-on-five five ball screen offense versus ice. So we're not a team that iced a lot. So you can see the defense is late icing. Uh, but Rich Kelly understanding, hey, I'm trying to use this to the middle. If I can't, it just serves as my ability to reject the screen. Kevin Marfo understands my man is below the screen, so I'm going to roll hard to the rim. The pass comes in the form of a pocket pass, and now Kevin's job is to read this man. So we want to make sure most of our breakdowns, whether they're live or just dummy versus coaches, involve our forwards having to read a defender and then make their layup, then make their pass. All right, same idea versus high. Good false motion here. And then just quick understanding both roller and creator of what our, this is our scout team here, probably day before a game, what they're trying to accomplish. All right, they're taking away our ball handler. Short roll to the middle of the floor. And then now his job is to read the defense. So I would say for us, this is a good possession, but we would want this to be an extra pass to a great shooter in the corner. Tyrese is also a good shooter, knocks it down. I guess what I want to try and connect is when we go one on oh, two on oh, two on two, three on three, it all leads to this. It's all got to lead to this decision, this decision out here by the ball handler and then these decisions versus closeouts. This is us running a, a common kind of false motion set into a ball screen, excuse me. So 
So now Brendan McGuire has a decision to make. He's got to read the big. It's an escape. It's a short roll. And then a really good job of playing, getting the ball out of his hands. So now we can go what we call play four on three after we create the trigger. And then a good job attacking a closeout, finishing. Just a little bit more false motion, escape, opposite, extra. That's, that's, a, that's a great possession for us versus a team that's going to be aggressive in pick and roll. Escape, move it, go play four on three. All right, same thing versus the switch. Now, we use a terminology called uh, simple. It's called back. And all we're trying to say with back is, is uh, when we get switch, you know, if we have an opportunity to just go and beat a mismatch, we'll take it. But what we really like to do is get the ball out of our ball handler's hands, put the big five man off the ball for a split second, and then return the ball back to our ball handler to play one-on-one. -on -one. So here's a situation again, the ball's moving, a little bit of false motion, angled step, ball screen. We get a switch, Tyrese Williams recognizes it. All five players on our team, rollers, spacers, handlers, should be yelling back, back, back. So now the play's over, we give it up, we get it back. And then now you're, if you have good shooters, they're better off the catch as opposed to the dribble. So now we have a catch and shoot three, or we have a one-on-one -on -one closeout situation. All right, so we'll try and give you some game examples now um, of kind of how we would, we would look at film and, and refer back to our practice habits. So again, a, a low ball screen, low coverage, below the, below the screener. Our, Rich Kelly's uh, his priority is to attack and play one-on-one -on -one with the big. We saw this one already. A little pistol action. Good hit and hold. Good skip opposite, ready to catch and shoot. So again, our guys being comfortable and confident once they see a certain coverage. Same thing versus ice. We're going to make sure that angle is sending our ball handler to the baseline, to the sideline, so we can get contact, recognizing the defender is low. Hard roll. Guard decides that the proper delivery is early in the pocket. Big has to read the help. Good read. And obviously, if you have shooters that, that teams are going to want to take away, it's going to help your bigs make easier decisions. Again, a very similar one to we saw before. Good changing of the angle by Kevin. Good setup by Tyrese Williams. All right, now he's playing with the big. Kevin's going to have to roll behind this hard. And if he doesn't get it, he's in great position to get an offensive rebound. And Tyrese Williams is a very good pull-up jump shooter off the dribble. Game examples versus high. Marist is one of the better teams in our league in pack line, really showing on pick and roll. Good job by our guard getting the ball out early. This, this short roll attracts the weak side in, makes the right read, gives it up, full ball reversal, and now we're playing four on three. Good touch and go right here. Again, Marist is a no paint defense, so they do a good job taking away Seth. We go play four on three, quick ball reversal to a good shooter. And then again, this, this one that we've, we've worked with Seth on a lot, showed a lot of progress during the year of reading the defense and making the right pass. Game example of how we play against the switch. One thing we really want to emphasize is not being uh, passive versus switches but being aggressive. So we do a really good job there by Rich of taking his man off the dribble and, and reading the help. 
obviously there's an opportunity there to finish. But what happens a lot of times is you beat the big, and now we create our triggers by breaking him down, causing help, and then we get our easy shots out of driving kick. So we recognize giving it up and getting it back, and this is just the talent that, that Rich had to be able to make shots, and that was a good shot for him where it may not have been for others. And this is Savion Lewis, who's very quick. He recognizes a switch and recognizes an early ability just to go by his man. And then we want him to be continue to get better at, obviously he's got the rim here, but if this help is a little bit earlier, making sure this pass gets delivered opposite, they X out, this will probably end up in this shooter's hands if there's too much help. This is a really good example for us of UNH did a tremendous job of switching everything. But just because they're switching, it doesn't mean we have to go right to back action. We want a hard roll. Uh, we, they miscommunicated the switch a little bit. Obviously, you can see their intensity to take away threes weak side. We're able to, even though they're switching, get our big behind the switch and still get that lob. All right, so uh, I think we have enough time for some questions. My conclusion, um, just simple ways for us in practice to create simple and familiar spacing so that when our guys get in the game, all they really have to read is how is the defense playing this play after play after play, being able to react to adjustments, putting the defense in position to have to make decisions and communicate. Uh, and, and really, we're trying to teach our offense how to find the trigger. And we can't spend time on 10 different concepts offensively and be good at reading all of those. For some teams, that might be off-ball screening, uh, staggered screens, slip screens. Uh, for some teams, it might be playing out of the post. Uh, for our personnel the last couple of years, it's been ball screening. And um, you know, I think our guys over the course of the season have gotten better at it because we've spent a lot of time in practice, not only on uh, you know, the dummy breakdowns, but really applying those and understanding how to make the decisions from, from, every, from every position, including your forward uh, and, and your roller. So again, uh, Coach, thank you for the opportunity to present. I look forward to listening to everybody else. And uh, again, if you want to open it up to some questions, I'm happy to engage. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Thanks, Coach. That was awesome. Um, so I got a couple uh, questions I don't here. know if I'm, well, I'm going to stop the share here. OK. Uh, Sorry, I'm muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. Yep. All right, got it. Sorry. Cool. Yeah, we got a few questions coming in here. The first one was, uh, do you have any um, sets uh, that you use that involve two bigs? Or do you guys ever play with two bigs? I got you. Yep. Yeah. So I, immediately I was going to say, yeah, we will. We'll, we'll use a lot of double ball screens and we'll use both bigs in that. But I think the question is, do we play two bigs very much? We do not. Um, we do not use two bigs very often. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's the way we've recruited. That's the way, you know, as a, as a team, we're going to play most often. Um, that's the way I'm most familiar with, with coaching the game. So that's probably more something that I've emphasized with our staff is that we want to play more of a spread style. Um, but I do think it's on us to, if we evaluate, hey, our best lineup is with two bigs. Uh, that we find a way to play. And there's a lot of ways to play with that. And you can play pick and roll out of that. Um, so we haven't, we've had four men that could really shoot the ball. And that's been, uh, that's helped us a tremendous amount in terms of playing uh, spread pick and roll. Cool. Uh, next one. I, uh, I should say this, like, obviously, that's why I really wanted to go into more than like our plays, more like our teaching breakdown, so that if you do play it with two bigs, you're going to run different stuff, but I still think a lot of the teaching can, can carry over. Cool. Um, yeah, next one. Um, what, uh, what are some reads uh, that you use versus teams that intentionally go under, um, or do you just always shoot behind uh, on teams that go under? Yeah, I have, have a guard that can, that can uh, shoot from 30 feet. Yeah, <laughs> I, think that, I think that's a real decision, you know, is, is if you have guards, like if you have um, – like I was saying before at Villanova, you really, it was hard to go under our guards. We had talented players. For us at Quinnipiac, we had to more uh, be mindful of running pick and roll with certain players. And if you have one guy that can shoot the ball off the dribble, 
and teams give you a problem going under the other guys, I would really prioritize your offense in terms of the pick and roll to be used for that one guy. Um, you know, that's something we'll have to look at next year with a different type of point guard. But I, I think pick and roll, I think you're running ball screens uh, can still be done with guys who don't shoot it great. But the under, you're going to have to counter that with, you know, we would counter it um, with setting them lower, uh, with doing what we call twisting it, which is obviously the screen rescreen. But more than anything, like your ball handler, if he can't shoot, hopefully he's really quick. And then him just being able to beat the under to the other side of the screen, you know, trying to beat that under. That's how we talk to our guys a lot is like, don't let them go under to keep you out of the paint. Get in there. And if they do a great job of beating you to the other side, that's when we would twist the screen and rescreen it. Here, Coach. Um, next one. Uh, how would you uh, – interesting question, maybe for like uh, – especially at the, maybe a high school level. How would you run this if you have a small team without like uh, one definitive big? Yeah, that's good. Um, I would just evaluate for, for, for you, um, A, if you have that personnel, how is a team going to play you, you know? Because um, I think the first two things you want to try and evaluate is who's their, who's their most immobile player? And then how are they going to use him in pick and roll defense? So even if I have five, six, two guys, if the other team has a six, seven guy who can't move his feet, whoever that guy is guarding is our five man. And he's setting ball screens and he's rolling or popping based on his based on his strengths. But it's a lot of time about engaging the other team's most immobile player. So when you see some teams like Texas Tech who are incredible defensively, their scheme is awesome, but they have every player on their team is mobile as hell. Where is their weak link? It's hard to find. And I think as a coach, if you can prepare your team and know, all right, these are the guys that we're going to try and engage. So if you have a team like that, maybe it's you know, the guy who's setting the screens is really the guy who's guarded by the other team's most immobile player. Um, and then obviously, you know, if you have a guy that uh, is really good in, in matchup situations, using him to set screens uh, on the other team's smallest player and create mismatches. Because I do think if you're going to play five smalls together and run pick and roll, the most common tactic to defend it will be, will be switching. So I think practicing uh, with your team, knowing – how our team's going to play us and spending a ton of time on that in, in practice is, is important. Um, okay. Um, time for just one or two more here. Uh, at the high school level, um, we see a lot of switching. Um, would you use uh, fake actions against this, against this or go right at it and teach spacing and redrive without great shooters? Yeah, I think it's a matter of deciding your personnel. Like, do you have good isolation players? Um, obviously switching is designed to take you out of what you want to run and make you play basketball. And so I think that's going to be a really important point uh, going forward as more people switch is do your players just know how to go play. And so uh, when you play against switching, I think the common tactics you can do is set screens, create switches and go at mismatches. I think that's number one. And then number two is slipping screens um, with your five man or guard to guard, you know, running pick and roll and slipping out of it, trying to confuse the communication of the switch. And a lot of times that's going to allow you downhill uh, or that's going to allow you an easy pass to that roller. But, you know, you want to really confuse the switching by using a lot of slipping or you want to take advantage of the switching by creating matchups that are in your favor. Um, I think for every coach understanding his own personnel, is, uh, is, is really key in that. So um, I, I don't think there's one answer. I think those are the most common and probably best options. But I think reminding ourselves, like, what are teams trying to do when they switch? They're trying to not let us run our plays, and they're forcing us to go play basketball. And I think a great example of that would be, like, if you watched, um, like if you watched Villanova versus Kansas in the Final Four in 2018, Kansas is a high-low team. Uh, two big team, Villanova switched, invited post-ups. And, um, and, and it really took a team who liked to execute their plays out of running the plays, forced them into playing a lot of one-on-one -on -one or trying to throw inefficient high lows over the top. And, and as an offensive team, you want to try and prepare your players 
this isn't going to let us be hesitant. Uh, great. Uh, all right, last one, Coach. Uh, so what are your teaching points um, that you use in regards to preventing bigs from setting illegal screens? That's a really good one. Um, it's funny. I, I think it's one of those things that doesn't get called. Uh, and when it does, you're like, all right, you're not, our refs aren't consistent with calling that, you know, I think at any level. Uh, but I don't, I honestly, we don't even spend a ton of time on it other than if you know the team is hedging, you should never get called for an illegal screen because you're touch and go. You're running up to that ball handler's hip. You can touch his hip and then sprint out of it and find the ball. So that eliminates the possibility for an illegal screen versus certain coverages. And then when teams drop and play passively and we want to really set and hold, you know, we talk about our guys, hey, give it a step. But, um, you know, I think both ball handler and screener understanding if you're playing against passive coverage and you're trying to execute a hit and hold, it's important to guard weight, set it up, come off shoulder to shoulder, and then the big give a step. But, you know, there's certain things in a game that happen uh, that you're going to get mad at your players for. If our guy's sprinting into it and trying to set a hard screen, um, I'm, I'm okay with it. You know, there's certain we – don't, we don't foul out as a team, but there's certain types of fouls that, um, hey, if you're, trying to, if you're trying to get your player open by setting a screen, it's illegal. If it's egregious, you know, we'll pull you out and we'll teach you. But, but I, I, don't, I don't mind it, and it's not one of those things that you get three or four calls in a game. Cool. That's awesome, Coach. Um, awesome. So thank you. Uh, thank you again for your time. I can't tell you how much I appreciate, um, you know, how much you've done for me personally since you got the job at Quinnipiac and, and being here today is awesome. Um, and, and for everybody, I, I think they would agree. That was, a, that was an awesome talk. So I, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. You're, you're great for basketball in our region and uh, everything you're doing for your foundation and for the game is, is greatly appreciated, man. We're really proud of you. Cool. Thanks, Coach. We'll see, we'll see you soon.